Well, I've got a little bit of a confession to make uh, to you today. So just getting that right off at the beginning. And that, and that is, is that until I was the age of 25, uh, I was scared of roller coasters. Absolutely terrified to ride roller coasters. And I think it might have a little bit of something to do with a traumatic childhood experience. Because when I was like seven years old, our family had gone to Disney World and we had been walking around Disney World all day. And then we made it to Tomorrowland in Disney World. And as we're walking around in Tomorrowland in Disney World, we see this little thing up on an elevated track called the People Mover. And I was like, I want to ride the People Mover. And so we go and get in line for the People Mover and anticipate Participation is building. I mean, the people mover is like moves five miles an hour. It doesn't go up any hills. It's just kind of really slow all around tomorrow. And that's what we wanted to ride. That's what I wanted to ride. So we get in line for the people mover. And we're standing in line. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. Then we go into a building, which I thought that's a little weird because the people mover is outside, but we go into a building. So we go into the building. And then as we get closer and we get closer, we get up to the car and get ready to get into it. And I realized that's not the same car as what I saw outside on the people mover. Like these cars actually like look like little rocket ships. And uh, it looks like we're about to do something a little bit different here than what I was signing up for. And uh, so we get on that. Y'all know what we were about to get on? Yeah, we're about to get on Space Mountain. Now, listen, my dad's probably watching today. I love my father. He's highly educated. I don't think he made a mistake. (laughs) I'm pretty convinced today at 46 years old that uh, he knew exactly what he was doing. And so we get on to Space Mountain. I can still remember the screams of the man in front of us on on that ride. I mean, it terrified me. And for years... I was scared of roller coasters. Then fast forward my senior year of high school. I'm the captain of the basketball team. Our coach announces we're going to go on a basketball team building trip uh, to Kings Island Amusement Park in Cincinnati, Ohio. And so we go to Kings Island and I'm terrified the whole ride up because I'm like, how am I going to, as the leader of this team, how am I going to fake it through the day and not get on any roller coasters? And, you know, I'm, I'm like, hey, listen, I get motion sickness or my stomach hurts. You know, I was trying to think up of all the excuses. Well, my coach being the compassionate man that he is, he kind of picked up on my uneasiness. He goes over to this little stand. They were selling soft serve ice cream. He gets me an ice cream cone. He brings it back over to me and says, hey, because you're a softy, uh, I'll give you this <laughs> ice cream cone. So I li- and so finally he just kind of put the gauntlet down. I'm like, okay, What's the biggest, baddest roller coaster uh, at Kings Island? And so at the time, it was called the Vortex. Had one of the top drops, like a 85 degree drop right out of the beginning. It went upside down eight times. I'm like, we're gonna ride that. So I got on the Vortex. I grabbed on, white knuckled the whole way through, screamed the whole way through, but I made it. And slowly but surely, yes, yes, please applaud for that. (laughs) Some of you feel my pain. Well, fast forward, Carmen and I get married and we're going to an amusement park with some of our friends and it's called Cedar Point and this is in Northern Ohio. So apparently if you wanna ride roller coasters, go to Ohio. So we go to Cedar Point and in the tagline of Cedar Point, their tagline is America's Roller Coast. So now I know my stamina for roller coasters is really gonna be tested. And they had just opened a brand new ride at the time. It was called the Millennium Force. And at the time, the Millennium Force was the tallest roller coaster in America. The Millennium Force was a brand new steel coaster that had new technology so that when you took off out of the station, you went straight up the hill and it kind of had this hydraulic arm, not the old chain that, you know, is kind of to chunk, to chunk, to chunk, to chunk. No, no, no. This thing that kind of goes up smoothly uh, and then it kind of pulls you up to the top. And then as you get to the top of the roller coaster, it kind of slings you over the top straight down. There's Lake Erie in the background, you know, and you're going straight down this thing, 300 feet, 93 miles an hour, and then only to be greeted by the second hill, which for itself was one of the tallest uh, hills in America. So in and of itself. And so you go through that all at night, very, very high speeds. And so we get to the end of the roller coaster. It was amazing. We had a lot of fun. We're high-fiving each other. Uh, But the thing that was crazy about the Millennium Force 
was not really the hills or the speed. I'd kind of built up myself for the hills and the speed. What was crazy about the Millennium Forest for me was the seat that we had to sit in on the ride. Now, we got, a, we got a picture of that. And the seat was basically uh, just a platform with a folding chair on it. I mean, that's essentially what I saw when we got on this thing. You know, like a lot of roller coasters, you get on them and you kind of get down in there, right? You know, and you kind of wedge yourself in. If it's going to be really fast or aggressive roller coaster, you kind of have some safety there. You can kind of wedge up against the side. Not this thing. I mean, you're out there for God and everybody to see you, you know, and you're going up that hill and it's basically straight down, straight down, 300 feet, right down to the ground. And, you know, if you look at the caption of that picture, here's what it says about, the, about this. It says, stadium seating. <laughs> well, listen, I'm all about some stadium seating in a stadium, but not on my roller coaster. And then if you zoom in a little bit closer, here's where it gets really crazy. Take a look at this picture. What do you notice missing about the apparatus that holds you into this particular roller coaster? There's no harness. There's nothing over your shoulders. All that you've got on there is just that little bit of lap belt. So can you imagine being suspended 300 feet in the air, 90 something miles an hour, and all you've got is a little bitty lap band? You better believe when I got on that thing, I was pushing, 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 hoping, man, please do not break loose. And of course, we made it all the way through the ride, got to the end, and literally... And I saw it happen time and time again. But literally at the end of the ride, we, we cheered for a good minute, just like, just loud cheers. A, that we were safely back, uh, but B, because it was amazing. And you know, as I sit there and think about this roller coaster, I started to reflect on why is it that I had confidence to get on the roller coaster? Well, was it because the amusement park told me to get on the roller coaster? Well, that might have been part of it, but that's really their job too, right? Their job is to sell you to get on the roller coaster. So that, that wasn't really it. Then my second thought was, well, is it because I knew that probably some engineers who got a lot of schooling, some of them probably went to Georgia Tech and had PhDs, they figured out all the engineering on this thing and, and, and they say it's going to be safe. So is that why I'm confident to get onto this roller coaster? But then as I really thought about it, that's not it. And then I really reflect, like, what is the reason why was I confident to get on the roller coaster? Well, the reason I was confident is for one hour while we stood in line to get onto that roller coaster, I watched countless people get on, go up the hill, go around all the twists and turns and come back into the station and every one of them cheered. And I saw that happen over and over and over again. The track record of the roller coaster led to my trust in the roller coaster. The track record, what I saw it do over and over again, the testimony of all the people that rode the ride, that's what ultimately sold it for me because your track record equals trust. The track record that you have equals the trust that people will ultimately have in you. Carmen and I have been married 24 years and we don't trust each other just because we're supposed to, just because we, we took a vow a long time ago. No, we trust each other because for 24 years, there is a track record of hills and valleys and things that we've walked through and we've come through on the other side. And so we, we trust each other. Your track record equals your trust. And your track record is your brand. It's what other people think about. It's what other people think about you. It's what you do over and over and over again. It's what you repeat that people ultimately believe about you. So if you have a reputation today of being an honorable person or of being a helpful person, then you probably are an honorable or helpful person. Not because you say that you're honorable and helpful. You're honorable and helpful because people have seen that demonstrated in you probably more than once. And so now they've come to trust you as being honorable and helpful. If you're known as being a compassionate person, somebody who has empathy for others, 
People probably have seen that in you, not because you said you were compassionate, but because they've witnessed that in your life. If you are a restaurant franchise that has ice cream machines um, that constantly don't work, then that probably means you're <laughs> McDonald's, right? I mean, so it's your, you know, your, your reputation, right? I mean, it's all about the track record. You kind of know what to expect based on the track record. And that's true about all of us. It's true about all of us. And so there should be some conviction in there for us as we think about our track record and, and the reputation that we have among other people. But today, what we are specifically talking about is we are specifically talking about the track record of God. Because for God to make a statement in the book of Hebrews through his word, for him to say through the writer of Hebrews, and, and just as a reminder, the book of Hebrews is basically a recap of the faithfulness of God of everything that he did in the Old Testament. So the, the writer of Hebrews is, is looking back to the faithfulness of God and helping us understand all that God has done. And so for, for God to say through his writer, through his word, that let us hold unswervingly to the hope Hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. That is a massive statement and it has massive consequences for all of us because reality is, and we know this to be true. There's not one human being on the face of the earth that gets it right. A hundred percent of the time. Even the best leaders, the best athletes, the best, the best business people, the best CEOs, they do not get it right 100% of the time. Listen, in Major League Baseball, we put people into the Hall of Fame for batting 300, meaning they don't get it right 70% of the time. The best three-point shooter in the NBA missed 60% of his shots. And you can go on and on through life and the relationships that you have, and there's not one human being in your life that gets it right 100% of the time, even the best. And so as we look at the track record of God today, God is inviting us to test him. He's inviting us to, to take an honest look. He's saying, listen, don't just accept my word for it. Just because I say I'm faithful, don't just take my word for it. By his grace, he's given us examples all throughout the scripture. And he's saying, look, look at, look at my track record today. And so if you're coming in today skeptical, or if you're coming in today needing a boost to your faith, if you're coming in today thinking, man, I, I don't know if this is really true or not, I'm inviting you, don't just take God's word for it, look at his track record. Because you'll see over and over again, you see God promised an infertile Abram that he would be the father of many nations. Now listen, it doesn't take a rocket science to understand if, if you're infertile and you can't have kids and then God comes along and promises to make you the father of many nations, that sounds like crazy talk, right? But what did God do? He literally gave Abram and Sarah a son and made him the father of many nations. We are direct descendants as a part of the church of Jesus. We're direct descendants of Abram and him being the father of many nations. God promised that Noah, that, that God would protect Noah. And what did he do? He gave him an ark. They built an ark out in the middle of the desert and God protected his family. God promised Gideon, this is crazy to me. God promised Gideon in the Old Testament that he would be victorious in war. And Gideon was a general who had 32,000 troops under his command. Here's what God said. I'm gonna make you victorious in war over the Midianites. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your troops and I want you to pare them down to 300 from 32,000 to 300. And once you get it down to 300, then we're going into battle. Could you imagine that? That strategy session is like, listen, I want you to get rid of uh, 95, 99% of your troops. And then we're gonna go into battle. And yet that's what Gideon did. And he went into battle and was victorious. God promised Nehemiah that he would get to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. After others had been trying for 14 years or so, God sent Nehemiah to build a two and a half mile wall around Jerusalem. And he and his team rebuilt the wall in 52 days. And in the book of Isaiah, it says, for unto you a child will be born. And then we see years later that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. 
to be the savior of the world, fulfilling over 400 Old Testament prophecies about his coming. God said over 400 times, a Messiah is coming, a Messiah is coming. Someone who's gonna deliver the people is coming. And then he came in the person of Jesus and he fulfilled all 400 of those prophecies about himself. God's track record is 100%. He is faithful and true. And he's asking us today to look at his track record and trust him, not on just what he says, but on what he has done. You know, as we think about track record today, I wanna to give you three things. I'll give you three, three ideas, three points, and then we'll, we'll be done. Track record is based on what we say, on what we do, and the price we pay. Say, do, and pay. Let's just say those three words. Say, do, and pay. So if you wanna know how to build your reputation, build your track record, it's gonna be based on how, what you say, what you do, and the price you pay. First of all, it's on what you say, right? Words matter. We see that all throughout scripture. The book of James tells us your words matter. Your tongue is like a rudder of a ship. You have the opportunity through what you say to build others up or to tear them down. You have the ability through your mouth to make good decisions or to make bad decisions. Whole cities have been burned down because of the words that people say. It's true. So words matter. God spoke the, wor the world into existence through his word. In the beginning, God created the world. He breathed it out. He said it. The book of John tells us in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Words are important. But we also know intuitively words are not enough. Yeah, I, I'm a parent. I've got four kids at home. Uh, I've got three of them that are teenagers. Uh, so y'all can pray for us right now. You just go write that down. Prayer request today. Pray for Pastor Aaron. Three teenagers. One of them just turned 16 uh, two days ago. So pray again for Pastor Aaron. But we tell our kids all the time, listen, listen, somebody, I, you know, I love you, but it's not just what you say. You can't just say you're sorry. I need to see that backed up by something. And so we're constantly just telling them, listen, your, your words are, are good and you're, you're saying the right things, but I just need to see that backed up. And, and you know, of course, they're always like, hey, we're sorry, we're sorry, sorry. And again, my son who's 16, he's an awesome kid, great student, uh, very entrepreneurial, amazing kid. But one day I came home from church. So we'd been at church at Trillith. I came home. Uh, and I, I come into our master bedroom, like my wife and I's room. And, and listen, he has his own room, but I come into our master bedroom and he's in our master bedroom. He's like made himself at home right in there. Like he's on, the ma he's on our bed, he's got the covers pulled up and he's watching TV. I was like, buddy, you know, you've got a room, we've got a living room. I mean, there's a couple TVs in the house. Like you could like literally go anywhere. He's like, oh yeah, and, and, and listen, and this isn't the first time we've talked about this. You know, so you're like, you're back in here again and let's just not like be in here. And so, okay, he leaves, he leaves. Yeah, sorry, dad, sorry, dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as sure as I'm standing here, I come back two hours later <laughs> and the dude is back in the bed. <laughs> but this time he's brought his friend Chipotle with him. And he has like got chip shrapnel everywhere, all over the bed. There's guacamole on the bed. I mean, he's just kind of, I mean, he's just having a big old party right there in our room. And I lose my ever-loving mind. I lose my mind. I was like, buddy, you're gonna have to like get out now. And you're gonna like actually have to give dad a moment here because this is gonna be bad if you don't. But it's not about just what we say, right? It's also about the second thing, it's what we do. Again, going back to the book of James, it says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Why? Because our actions, what we do, put tangible activity behind the words that we say. The things that we do put tangible activity behind the words that we say. And so anybody can go out and say, I am awesome at X. I'm, gonna, I'm awesome at business. I'm awesome at athletics. I'm awesome at being married. I'm awesome at whatever. But it's only when you put activity behind that that people actually believe you. So you can say all day long that you're the, you know, the second coming of Michael Jordan. But until I see you out on the court, I'm not going to believe you. And then when you get out on the court, you will actually disprove the words that you were saying. Because there's been one Michael Jordan. 
But when we put our words into action, when we put our words into action, that's when it starts to become believable. But when our words and our actions don't match up, that's when everything falls apart. So in the 1960s, President Lyndon Johnson was faced with a conflict in Southeast Asia. And so in order to, in, in order to work on that conflict, in order to hopefully de-escalate the conflict, he went on the television and told the American people, we're gonna send advisors into Southeast Asia. But then over time, in, in a couple of years, the American people began to figure out that actually we don't have advisors in Southeast Asia. We're actually at war and we literally have hundreds of thousands of our troops there in Southeast Asia. And so it became evident that the things that were being said and the things that were being done were two different things. And it created such a problem over Johnson's presidency that he didn't run for president again in 1968 because his words and his actions didn't match up. And so he lost credibility. He lost trust. So what we say and what we do are important. One of the amazing things, and you've heard us talk about this a lot at Passion City Church, one of the amazing things about the gospel that we read about in scripture is that it happened in a real time in a real place. It happened in a real time and real place. And here's the beautiful thing about it is you can go today to the places that you read about in scripture. You, you can go to the pool of Bethesda today and you can actually see the five colonnades that are described in the book of John. Did you know you can do that? You can go today and see it with your own eyes. And, and you can go to the Valley of Allah where David killed Goliath. And, and you can go to the tomb where Jesus was buried and you can actually look in there and see that it's empty. And you can go on and on and on and on and on through everything you read in scripture. You can go see it in a real time and real place. And it bolsters our faith because we then realize when we see the actual place, we realize that it's not just a bunch of words, but it actually happened in a real time and real space, tangible people. There were eyewitnesses that saw it all go down and their stories have been told throughout the generations. And so we can trust it. Words matched up with activity. But the third thing that we need to understand is that it's not just about what we say or what we do, but ultimately the things that we trust the most, the people that we trust the most are the ones who paid a high price to get where they are. So yes, you can match up, say and do all day long and that's amazing. And that's where most of us live. But the people that we trust the most are the ones that paid a really, really high price. We know that they sacrificed something significant to get to where they are. And so if they sacrifice something significant to get to where they are, then, then we're, gonna, we're gonna listen to what they have to say that much more because it's believable. Because we know that we probably wouldn't have had the stamina to get through what they got through to get where they are. And so we trust them. I read a biography a couple years ago about Bruce Springsteen. Bruce Springsteen is arguably one of the greatest rock and roll legends of all time. And Bruce Springsteen ten, spent 10 years to become an overnight success, okay? Spent 10 years to become an overnight success. And he tells a story about one of his first gigs out on the West Coast. And so they, they loaded up a, a 1948 flatbed truck, Ford pickup truck in Asbury Park, New Jersey, and a station wagon. And he and the band drove across uh, the whole United States in three days to get to this gig out on the West Coast. So on their way back to New Jersey after their, their gig out there, uh, the station wagon broke down. So like in true rock and roll fashion, the station wagon broke down. And so now they've got to figure out like, how do we get everybody back to New Jersey um, and we're down one car? And so they knew that they could fit one more person up in the cab, but like, where are the other people going to go? So there were two more people that they needed to get somewhere. Well, they had built this box on the back of their truck and that housed all of their equipment. And so they got on the side of the road, they got all the equipment out, they rearranged all the equipment. And in the top of the box, they had left a two foot tall by eight foot long section. And two of the band members, Bruce included, climbed into that box and rode all the way across the country in that box on top of the equipment. I knew right then and there, I'm not called to be a rock and roll musician. 
Because I would not have paid that price. I would not have loved it that much because I wasn't willing, I wouldn't be willing to sacrifice in that way. And you think about all the people that you respect, they pay a high price for what they do. Hours and hours honing their craft. You know, one writer talks about it, it takes 10,000 hours to become great at something. And those that are truly great probably put in that kind of time. They pay a high price. But everything that I've just talked about by way of example doesn't even come close to the price that Jesus paid to back up his words. Doesn't even come close. So Philippians chapter two tells an amazing story of the incarnation of Jesus or the coming to earth of Jesus. And at the start of Philippians two, it says, consider others more highly than yourself. So consider others more highly than yourself. And then Philippians two goes on to tell us how we can consider others more highly than ourselves. And it says, have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So it tells us right there that we can't do it on our own. So if we wanna consider others more highly than ourselves, we're gonna have to take on the mind of Jesus. And then it goes on and tells the story of Jesus's incarnation. And we, we pick up the story in Philippians chapter two, verse six. It says this about Jesus says, who being in the very nature, God. So meaning right out of the bat, Jesus is God. He's fully God, but yet coming to earth. However, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, or he didn't consider it to be something used to his own advantage. But here's what he did. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. So let's just stop there for a second. Jesus possessed all of the rights of God. Jesus was at the pinnacle of creation and yet gave up those rights, left those heavenly rights to come to earth. So right then and there, that's a sacrifice that most of us would be unwilling to pay. In our culture, we're taught that once you get to the top of the ladder, you don't wanna come down the ladder. You wanna stay up at the top at all cost. But Jesus, who is in his very nature, God, by definition at the top of the ladder, he descended down that ladder and he made himself what? A servant, made himself a servant so that he could serve others. And then what's it go on to say in verse eight? It goes on to say, but being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so not only throughout scripture do we see story after story where God said something and then he did something, but we ultimately see in the person of Jesus that he was willing to pay an ultimate price because he understood that the wages of sin is death. He understood that for all of us that We are broken people and we are sinful people and there's nothing that we can do to have a right relationship with God. And in order to have a right relationship with God, there has to be a a sacrifice. And so God's plan A for all of humanity was Jesus and Jesus was that sacrifice. And so he had to descend out of heaven down to earth. So that what? So that we could have a relationship through him with God the Father. And the scripture goes on to say that it's not by works that you have been saved. It's only by the grace of God. It's only by his mercy. So that's the thing. There's nothing that we have to do to earn that relationship with God. There's nothing that we have to do. He's just asking us today to trust him. He's saying to us, look at my 
track record. And he's ultimately saying, look at what I have done on your behalf. So I would imagine in this room today, there's a lot of people that at some point in your life, you've placed your faith in Jesus. You've come to a place where you, you recognize that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so for you today, this message is a reaffirmation, hopefully, of your, of your faith. It, it's a reminder that God's word is true. And even though when I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death, and I, I lose sight of what God's doing, as the song reminded us earlier, I can look up and keep my eyes on Jesus today. And so hopefully for many of you in the room today, that's where you're at. You're being reminded today that I can look up, I can trust Jesus, not because of just what he said, but because of what he has done and ultimately the price that he paid. And I can be reaffirmed believing that what he has done in the past, he will do in the future. And if you need another tangible reminder of that today, then just, just, just take somebody to lunch because I guarantee you there's hundreds of stories in this room today of people who could tell you about the faithfulness of God in their lives. And just as a little bit of a side note, if you're wondering why we gather together as a church, if you're wondering like what, what was God's design in the church? Is it because he thought we needed a, a you know, inspirational music or an inspirational message? Is that, is that what the deal is? No, no, no. One of the main purposes of the church is so that we could gather together as a body and we could stare each other in the eye and remind ourselves of the faithfulness of God. So why do we need to be gathered in, the person, in, in person? It's so that we can look each other in the eye. When we see somebody nodding along, we know, okay, that person's been somewhere. When we hear a story like Suzanne's widow for 29 years, we can know like, She's been somewhere. She's walked through the valley of the shadow of death and she's come out on the other side. And I guarantee you there's dozens and dozens of stories like that. And so for some of you in this room today, you just need to be reminded of the faithfulness of God. But then for others of you today, up until this moment, you've somehow led yourself to believe that you are the master of your own destiny that somehow you are the, the king of your own life and that somehow salvation is dependent on you. And maybe if I just work a little harder, if I, just, if I do a little more to gain approval, if I just do the right things, if I say the right things, then maybe somehow God will find me righteous at the end of all this. And what you saw today for the first time is that there's nothing that you can do to earn God's approval that Jesus came so that you wouldn't have to strive any longer. And for some of you today, you need to step across the line of faith and you need to say, listen, God, I recognize today for the first time, I'm not in charge of all this. I've seen your faithfulness. I've seen your track record and I'm trusting you that you are in control of all this. And today, Jesus, I'm placing my faith in you. I'm placing my trust in you because I realize that I fall short of your glory all the time. And I recognize that ultimately it's Christ in me that is the hope of glory. And so for some of you today, you need to place your faith in Jesus. And we're gonna give you an opportunity to do that here in just a moment. But God has proven his faithfulness over and over and over again. And he's saying to us today, listen, you can go back and test me all along the way. And I have been true every step 